to stand with me as we do the call for worship. Blessed be you, O Lord of Israel, for you have looked favorably on your people and redeemed them. You have raised up the mighty Savior for us and our sisters of the living. You have remembered your holy covenant, the very oath that you swore to our ancestor Abraham, so that we might serve you without fear in holiness and righteousness before you are.
And now we greet each other with the sign of peace. You guys ready? All right. So what big holiday is coming up this week? That's right. And would you guys know what Thanksgiving is about? What do we do? Love. Be thankful. That's right. You give hugs. You give hugs. Love. Be thankful. And you give kisses. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. So you're all right. And so for Thanksgiving, we're supposed to think about the things we're thankful for. So what are some things you guys are thankful for? Yeah. Perfect. Great. Frustrate you guys. When you get frustrated, mad. You get mad. Doesn't the word for frustrated? What do you guys? Think? What makes you mad? When my mom, when my mommy takes my toy. Yeah, that's frustrating. What about you guys? What about you, Raven? Um, I don't know. No, you never get mad. I know you get mad. What do you get mad? Playing and having fun, and mommy and daddy tell you it's time to get ready for bed or to take a bath. Is that is that make you frustrated? Yeah. All <laughs> <laughs> right. So I'm going to tell you a secret: is God wants us to be thankful not just when things are going well, but when we're frustrated too. Even when it's hard, we need to think of things to be thankful for. So, what are some things that we can be thankful for about going to bed? Do you guys have any ideas? I'm going to 
stay in bed forever. I want to stay in bed. I want to stay in bed with my pillow. Okay, well tell me about, okay, so tell me about your beds. I'll bet you, you guys all have your own beds? I have my own bed. I have my own bed. Yeah, do you guys have anything pretty on your beds? Like, what's your design? I have, I have one, and it's a unicorn. Whoa, that's so cool. So me is a unicorn, too, don't you so? Yes. Yeah, well, what do you have? I have a unicorn, too. Oh my goodness, everybody has unicorns. That's so cool. What about you, Wendy? What's your bed look like? something and I know this is a little sad but you need to know that not all little girls have their own bed you can ask Miss Whitaker some of them don't even have a bed to sleep in and if they do have a bed they don't all get special unicorn sheets sometimes they have to just sleep in whatever's available or share beds with other people so that's something that we need to be thankful for is even if I don't want to go to bed well, that's wonderful. And so now you can think about that. Even I like to have my bed with mom and dad. Yeah, I understand that. And so what about that, that you have a mom and dad that will maybe snuggle with you before bed? What else do you guys do before bed? I play with me before bed. Yeah, Mommy nice. lays with me for, for a few hours and then she goes down to my bed. Oh, okay. And I tell my girls that they turn in the morning. Oh, and you go okay, the next morning, yeah. I sit on the couch and eat cookies. <laughs> Great. This is really going well for me. All right, so, um, what, and what about your mom and dad? Did they read you all some books before bed? My mom reads me. My mom and dad read me some stories sometimes. Well, do you know the fact that you have books and you have mommies and daddies that read you? That makes you really special and something to be thankful for. Not everybody has that. So what we're going to do, these are great examples. These are great examples of things that we can be thankful for, even when we're frustrated. So what I want you to do is to try to think about that this week, about all the different ways that we can be thankful. Can we say a prayer real quick? All right. Dear Lord, thank you for Thanksgiving and giving us an opportunity to show how thankful we are for all of your many blessings. And please help us to, when things aren't going so well, when we feel mad or frustrated, to remember the ways that we're still blessed and to feel thankful for those. December 3rd, First Presbyterian is going to host two things going at once. We're going to have gift, good gifts for all, which we used to call the alternative gift market. But we think that name was a bit misleading, and we want to include the community in it. So we're going to have an opportunity to give good gifts for all, and that's going to be in the Mulberry Room. And then we're going to add pictures with Santa in the fellowship hall. So it's going to be open to the public. So we hope people will come before, maybe during, or while they wait for Santa in the parade or after. So it'll be open from 9 to noon on that Saturday, December 3rd. And we're going to ask organizations to come and kind of list what people could give. So you don't just donate the place to sleep, but you could give this much for a pillowcase. You could give this much for sheets. You could, you'll know exactly what your gift could be buying. So the organizations this time are going to include Habitat for Humanity, our Church's Garden Fund, Heifer International, Tyson's Chance in Greenberg, A Place to Sleep, Give a Kid a Brighter Day, the Kentucky Refugee Ministries, the Veterans Rural Outreach, Fair Trade Chocolate, our Outreach Committee will be collecting the Christmas baskets, Bible for Graduates, all kinds of good opportunities, and our Backpack Projects. So I know you're sitting there thinking, man, I would love the opportunity to help that Saturday. There's so many ways you can do it. One way is to pray and support us with your prayer life. We also want you to invite your friends. Think of somebody that may have young children that will get people in the doors of this church. And to sign up at the fellowship hall today. We've got a sign-up sheet because we need help. We need Santa's helpers, someone just kind of mosey around out there to keep kids happy, kind of show them where the mind forms keep them out of this room where the choir is, maybe keep them from going upstairs, just kind of be on the spot. We need uh, kitchen helpers to kind of oversee and replenish the food and drinks, somebody to kind of bust tables, clear them between seatings, somebody to clean up just a half hour afterwards, and then we need treats to get people in. So if you would like to bring some donuts or juice or fruit or hot chocolate packets or breakfast breads or muffins or something else people can pick up, candy canes, whatever, sign up out there so that we will 
count on you to help us. You can either bring them Friday before us and I are going to be setting up that late afternoon, or you can bring them Saturday morning. So tell your friends to join us Saturday, December 3rd. And then we'll have the same thing Sunday for our congregation. Without Santa. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm up here to talk about my favorite subject, money. Uh, I know everybody loves to hear that. Um, in, in the next week or so, we will be uh, sending out letters uh, to everybody in the congregation, and those letters will include uh, our per capita. And by the way, in your bulletin, you will see information about the per capita and how that's used. Uh, I can tell you, um, in the there was a couple of years when we um, we were able to get money back, actually more than we gave uh, to sponsor uh, Rivas Ninos. So uh, that money can come back to us as much as it has as we give. Also, there's pledge cards, um, and we'd like for you to fill those out. Uh, and send those back in. So be looking for the letters this week from the church. Please don't trash them. Uh, open them up and read them and, uh, and fill this out. Martha. This is for 2023. Yeah, the per capita is for 2023. We, w we need to pay that, by the way, um, in early January. So that is on the number of active members that we have within the church. We are assessed that, and we will pay that in January, whether you all have paid it up or not. The church will pay for that. But, but we'll take that money all year. Yes? You already paid your per capita, will that go for next year? That goes for next year. The per capita, if you paid it in the last month or so, that, that per capita goes for next year, not this year. Any other questions? Thank you.
join me in the prayer for illumination, which you can find uh, in your bulletin. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our reading from the Christian scriptures this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 22 to 30. Now listen for a word from God. Jesus went through one town and village after another, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. When once the owner of the house has gotten up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then in reply he will say to you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I do not know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrown out. Then people will come from east and west, from north and south, and will eat in the kingdom of God. Indeed, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. The grass withers and the flower fades, but these words of the Holy One endure forever. During the pandemic, we began offering a degree completer program at Bellarmine. The intention of the program is to provide a pathway for people to finish a bachelor's degree whose educational lives have been interrupted by an array of events. Michael is one of the first students who entered our Degree Completer program. He was also one of the first students to take my online Theology 200 prep class on Ultimate Questions. Michael is bright, hardworking, curious, and driven to succeed. Over the course of the online class, I read his essays, and then finally, near the end, we decided to meet together on Teams, face-to-face, -face, but distanced by technology. Michael wanted to ask some more questions about different religious traditions and shared with me that he had spent most of his life shut in a juvenile lockdown facility. He was monitored closely behind closed doors. I didn't ask him a lot about that experience. I just let Michael share what he wanted to share with me about that experience. Instead, we talked about meditation, contemplation, and what it means to love your neighbor. Michael's story was the first story that came to mind as I read and reflected on our passage for today. Now, I know that our scripture reading for today sounds harsh. We prefer a gentle Jesus who says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. We can't imagine God turning anyone away. We all want to feel sure that we're sitting at the table with God right now and will in the life to come. We're disturbed by the seemingly cruel nature of the master of the house turning anyone away not recognizing anyone, especially those who, like us, have counted on being followers of God. Imagine that you're knocking at the Lord's door. Can you hear your own voice of perplexity, frustration, and even anger? Lord, what do you mean you don't recognize me? Lord, what do you mean you don't know where I come from? Lord, what do you mean I cannot come into your house? What do you mean? I cannot join you at your table. Why am I shut out? Why am I shut up or shut down? What bothers us most about this image of God closing the door is that God acts too much like us in this story. 
seems to reflect our society's practices and attitudes toward others, even in some ways our policies. We're the ones who know deep down that we shut people out and often shut people down. We want God to be above the fray, certainly above participating in this seemingly cruel activity. The passage that we read this morning from the Gospel of Luke provides a counterweight to the way we traditionally understand God in the Christian scriptures as one who is mer merciful. Here the character sketch of God is rounded out. God is forgiving, yes, but also demanding. God is loving, yes, but that love does not always mean luxury and leisure. In fact, God loves us by urging us to move out of our comfortable places, to rush to the door, and to open it up for others. God is well aware that we are the ones who can close doors, and we find creative ways to, put, to shut people out. Mostly, we ignore them. We try to forget the needs of others that are out there who are knocking at our doors. We become so good at it in our society that we've learned how to screen calls, to only respond to emails when we want to, to monitor the entrances of our homes with cameras, and to create whole communities of people who look like us and act like we do. Supposedly, we sensibly only open doors and communities to familiar, trustworthy faces. Others are unwelcome. Doors are often closed all around us, doors that we have not dared to enter, not thought of responding to, and not risked opening. Because of our resistance to opening doors, persons and group groups are shut up, shut in, and shut down. We don't like to think about what goes on behind closed doors. Women are beaten. Children are abused. The language of hate flourishes. Behind closed doors, secret deals can be made. Conspiracies and con games coalesce. Behind closed doors, lonely persons can cry and moan. Their tears never met with caring shoulders. Their moans and cries never heard. Sometimes behind closed doors, children go hungry without enough food to eat for days on end. On a grander scale, our economic system closes doors on people. Some are unable to afford the very basics that, that are needed to sustain the, their lives and the lives of their families. The door to adequate health care can be closed. Doors leading to affordable script prescriptions are only cracked so that a few can fit through. Doors to educational facilities are slammed hard in the faces of many without the ability to pay or the resources for their own success. Prejudices can close doors too. Doors to employment, to better living conditions, doors to a good job. Equal pay for equal work is still an illusion. We often find comfort in the fact that what we do behind closed doors is not open to the public. We rationalize that no one is going to know. Don't open up Pandora's box. Don't let the secrets out in the open. Leave well enough alone. We're comfortable with the way we're living thus far. However, our passage today puts that in perspective. God knows, and quite frankly, God cares. What we do, the doors we close, or the doors that we choose to open, matter to God. God opens the door for us to another way of living this life. All we have to do is to look at the life of Jesus Christ and see an example of how God is about opening doors. Doors symbolize an opening to another way of living, another way of being in this world. 
Jesus was all about opening doors for others. Jesus and the first disciples opened many doors to the sick, outcasts, women, and children. They crossed boundaries of culture and religious faith. They helped God through their actions. Jesus taught us that faithful, living faithfully means making sure that no one is shut out, shut in, shut down, or shut up. It is the stone rolling away, the empty tomb where no one is shut in. Jesus' first disciples could not allow many days to pass before they told the story again and again and again. It mattered to them then, and it matters to God now that we continue to tell the story and to open doors for others. It certainly matters to ones that need love, and it certainly matters to all of us to receive love, as well as it matters to the one who ultimately is love. When Jesus called the disciples, he called them by saying, come and follow me. Jesus still calls disciples with those words, come follow me. Those words, I think, in many ways have become so familiar to us in Christian communities of faith that we forget the kind of radical power in them. Come and follow me. In 2010, my family lived in Hungary where I taught for a semester at Debertson Reformed Theological Seminary. Hungary as a nation has a long history of political repression and it continues to influence the politics of this country. There are two common sayings that capture well the realities of Hungarian life. Nehez az élet, life is difficult, and kichi kapu, the little gate. The little gate is both a metaphor and a practice in Hungary. When you visit Hungarian homes, one of the things that you notice is that there are fences that usually surround the front yards. There are also fences that uh, will surround many Hungarian institutions, such as schools, government agencies, and medical facilities. There's a large gate at the center of the fence to, enter, to allow one to enter directly in the front door and the public foyer of these buildings. But smaller gates, sometimes doors, are usually much more difficult to find on the side of houses or institutions, and are even around the corner to, corner to provide entrance into the heart of the home, the place where the people really live. In countries with long histories of political repression and oppressive regimes, you often must find indirect ways of creating change within them and influencing the direction of things. Jesus' teaching in this passage, strive to enter through the narrow door. Indeed, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. Reminds me of the practice of entering through the little gate. What does the practice of entering through the little gate and opening doors look like in our contemporary world? I don't know if you've ever heard the story of Ed Loring and Murphy Davis. Ed Loring and Murphy Davis were both Presbyterian ministers and they put a foot in the door to poverty in the Atlanta area. After they visited a Catholic worker house and learned about the story of Dorothy Day's ministry of creating hospitality houses where anyone could come and live just because they had need, Ed and Murphy opened the doors of their home to homeless persons in Atlanta, Georgia. A ministry to just a few in the 1980s later grew to a residential and non-residential ministry to hundreds a day. A soft bed, a warm meal, educational opportunities and caring people were always available at this ministry, pushing the door open to poverty wider and wider wider. They served primarily people who had previously been incarcerated. They were making sure that everyone in their city had enough, and they called that ministry the open door. I don't know if you also may have heard the story of another woman, a woman named Missy Hammerstrom. 
Missy Hammerstrom was so disturbed by her awareness that elementary school children in Louisville did not have enough to eat over the weekends that she started a new ministry called Blessings in a Backpack. As part of this organization, they packed a backpack full of food so that children could take it home on Friday so that they would have just enough food to be able to sustain themselves in an area with a tremendous amount of food insecurity. Missy Hammerstrom didn't want anyone to be hungry behind closed doors in our community. Let me offer one more story of a lawyer and civil rights activist who practiced opening doors and entering through little gates in her leadership as both a lawyer and later as an Episcopal priest. Her name is Polly Murray. Polly Murray was born in Baltimore, Maryland, but orphaned as a child and moved to Durham, North Carolina to be raised by extended family. While her family and black community were affirming and safe, Polly's life became unbearable in contact with the white world. The presence of the KKK pervaded the white community of Durham at the time. Fifty to sixty people were lynched each year when she was growing up. During her childhood, well-respected sociologists of the na in some of the nation's most esteemed institutions of higher education wrote prolifically about race determining one's ability, ability to succeed in school. Polly attended and graduated from Hunter College in 1928 as one of four black students in a predominantly white class. She applied to law school at the University of North Carolina in 1938, at a time when the institution was developing courses in race relations, and President Roosevelt actually went to celebrate the progressive uh, work that the school was doing on race. The same year that President Roosevelt spoke at UNC's graduation, Polly received a rejection letter from the University of North Carolina Law School. The violence of American culture, segregationist policies and practices, and the subjugation of blacks forced Polly to practice peaceful, nonviolent resistance and non-cooperation. She started what she called confrontation by typewriter. She started corresponding with Eleanor Roosevelt, and they became fast friends. She also began to travel around the United States, and in 1940, 15 years before Rosa Parks, she and a friend got on a bus from New York City to Durham, North Carolina, and refused to move to the back of the bus. They were jailed for defying Jim Crow. This type of experience only increased Polly's will to open doors and little gates through her advocacy for human rights for black Americans. Polly applied and was admitted to Howard Law School as the only woman in her class. Her intellect and discipline earned her top grades and the prestige of being the head of her class, but Jane Crow kept her bound. Her positions and accolades were taken from her. The arguments that Polly laid out in some of her papers were later used by male classmates in the landmark case of Brown versus Board of Education. I could name many more accomplishments, earning a doctorate, a prestigious job as the only black woman at a New York law firm, teaching in Ghana and at Brandeis University. Polly's thought laid the groundwork for so many of the rights and freedoms that each of our bodies enjoys in the United States today. In 1973, after the death of her partner, she ultimately discerned that all of the problems about human rights and issues with legal advances in the United States and around the world were actually moral and spiritual problems. The trouble, the trouble was the failure to identify the humanity and the common life <coughs> that surrounds and connects us all. Paula ended up going to seminary to become the first black Episcopal priest and would not let the violence of white supremacy snuff out the sound of the genuine in her. She worked tirelessly to open doors 
and Little Gates for people all over the nation. The doors and gates that we open, how we live, what we do as people of faith, it still matters. It matters for us, and it matters to God. We, too, are given an opportunity in these days, an opportunity to live out the story. We're still needed by God to help open doors for others. The door that we may, be op may open may be a virtual one, like an online class, enabling someone who had no access to education to earn a degree. The door that we may be open may be for a person who is homeless, who's seeking shelter in the cold. The door that we may open may be for a neighbor down the street, a friend at your school, someone who you know who is shut in, shut up, or shut down. Who do you know that lives behind closed doors in Shelbyville, in our state, in our nation, there are doors and gates that we can open, the people sitting right here in these pews, doorways that can open a new way of life for others and for all of us to live together well. We can't let ourselves shove God's love aside. We can live into this story. What we do matters. It matters to others. And it continues to matter to God. May that be our aim. Amen. All for able, uh, if we could stand together and affirm our faith, faith, using the words of a brief statement of faith, which you can find in your bulletin. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and the least of the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick. Binding up the broken heart, eating without thefts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the deaths of human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and Delivering us from death to life eternal. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus.
please pray with me. God, who lives and dwells among us, who loves us as we cannot love ourselves, we sit here this morning in your presence. We sit in awe of the beauty of your creation as the seasons change and brilliant hues of green, red, and yellow turn to brown. The crisp, cold weather reminds us of the nearness of year's end. As surely as the seasons change, we know you are ever present among us and remind us by your presence to embody your love in this community and in the world. We pray this morning for so many people who languish behind closed doors, for those who are grieving the death of family members, for those who are living daily in fear of being abused, for those who are feeling lonely we pray for those who are sick and wondering if they will be able to become well again. We pray for people who are shut behind bars and for the families of those who are incarcerated. We pray this morning for all those who experience hunger, particularly as we near a great day of Thanksgiving feasts. We pray that they will be able to find resources that they need. We're also so profoundly aware, great Holy One in our midst, that you have opened doors for so many of us and for so many others. You have shown us through the paths that Jesus has walked a larger imagination for what it means to carry your love out into community. Strengthen us, we pray this morning, that we may embody that love. We also pray silently for a few moments as we contemplate what opening doors and little gates may look like in this congregation in this local community and around the world. Strengthen us, God. Enliven our imagination and embolden us as we pray all these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory And now we have an opportunity to share our gifts uh, and dedicate our gifts of time and to share our financial resources by bringing our offering.
May these gifts give assistance to friends and neighbors in need. May our lives and actions give help and content to your world. And may we become a great people who joyfully do everything to the glory of your name. Amen. Protestants didn't disagree. This is a celebration today, one that I hope will lead us out into the community to open doors for others, to find little gates where there are people who are in need of uh, the access to resources to sustain themselves. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all as we open doors and little gates this day and throughout the week. Amen. Amen. 